beautiful people, my beautiful viewers, welcome to Movie Manual. This is yet another Saturday and I am here at Rest TV, Wumola. Today I'm very excited, but before I do anything, I'm going to thank God for the gift of life. Thank God for who he is in our lives, because without him, we are nothing and we can't make it without him. Thank you God for keeping us alive up to today. And I am excited and honored. I have two worlds with me right now. I have Mr. Director, eh? producer, producer, everything, <laughs> David Cecil, and then I have the Ugandan producer, director, filmmaker, Daniel Katende. They are here on the Movie Money. Welcome to the Movie Money, guys. Hi. It's good to have you. Uh, hi. <laughs> and just to correct you, uh, it's Daniel Katenda. By so the way, I even asked Joachim. Yes. And he was like, it's Katende, but it's all good. It's Daniel I was like, Katende. Is that a Muganda mm. name or what? Yes, it's a Mamba name. So I'm similar to Daniel Katenda. Yes, similar, I saw the Semlema, but I was mm. like, let me settle for Katende, thinking it was the right name. Yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I hate it when people call me a wrong name. <laughs> so, and I said, so it's good to see you guys. Mm. By the way, these people are the people behind uh, Imperial Blue movie. I don't know if you guys have seen it or heard about it. It's a movie that was shot in. It's a British Ugandan fantasy film. It was filmed in the UK, India, and Uganda. Those are three locations. It's not easy, but we are going to get there because I'm sure there must have been a lot of money there. I don't know how I missed <laughs> to be part of that, but anyway. <laughs> in our it dreams. was written by a British writer, director, Dan Moss, right? Uh, so me and Dan Moss are co-writers. Okay. But what's missing from this is that we wrote it We're in also we included a lot of Ugandans in the writing process. Oh, okay. Particularly, we workshopped on the script. Okay. So, um, and I built a lot of the dialogue from my own experiences living in Uganda for the last 14 years. Okay. So it was kind of a mix of script writing, workshopping, and just drawing real lines wow. from life. Wow. So I was supposed to start by saying, okay, so who is David Cecil, but now you right. can start by, by mm. saying, how long have you been in Uganda, you say? Uh, 2007, I first arrived. Okay, so you're yeah. in Uganda. Ah, I'm more specifically Mutoro. Ah, <laughs> Mutoro is Uganda, <laughs> but anyway, it's all good. Yeah. Okay, so, mm. uh, so who is, and how long have you been doing film? So I actually, this is our first big feature, me and uh, Dan, Samalama Daniel. It's our mm -hmm. first feature film, like proper full-length fiction film. Okay. But we've both worked on different documentaries, music videos, short films, mm. uh, theater, etc. And all in various capacities. So every, we have done every role from the runners all mm. the way up to directing our own projects. But mm. this project was directed by Dan Moss. But it, he's a British director, mm. but this was also his first feature film. So we are all virgins. That's nice. Yeah. It's good to know. So, D Daniel, mm. how was the collaboration like Uganda, British, and how did you find it? Um, it was an interesting Well, that's how long have you been doing film yourself? <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I'm actually a film graduate from Kampala Film School, and I graduated in, uh, I think it was 20, 2014. Okay. 2013. I'm, I'm yeah. forgetting the 2013. Then I had a stint in Rwanda where I was. Mm. managing a bit of TV station and then moved back to Kampala, then rejoined with David and yeah, we started working together on a couple of things, documentaries here, film mm. there, mm. music videos here and there. And so, as in, yeah, the dream, we're building the dream and getting ready to when we get the opportunity to be able so you people it. met at, at uh, Kampala Film School? So yeah. I was his lecturer mm. okay. and uh, Daniel impressed me a lot because he used to sleep through all the lectures <laughs> and then he would, w he would wake up at the end and always be the, you know, the, the wiseacre with the right answer oh. despite snoring loudly through the screenings. <laughs> oh my goodness. And so I thought, wow, this guy's... So I was about to yeah. ask of all the students that you had, why did you pick on Daniel? It's not even like I picked him, we just... <laughs> Ended well, up, our paths came yeah, like we, our paths crossed. Oh, yeah. okay. And, and I was, uh, sincerely, I was impressed at someone who can sleep through a whole lecture <laughs> and get the answers right at the end. Was he sleeping all that time? Uh, maybe, 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 maybe it was his way of... Most of the class. No, yeah, you'd watch bits of the film, like the beginning, then you watch the middle, <laughs> and also some bit of the end. So you, you only talk about those three yeah, parts that I you know, actually watched. I know some watched. filmmaker who told me that uh, mm. you can understand the film in the first 15 minutes. If you do not understand the film in the first 15 minutes, you're just wasting your time. You can mm. even go an hour and later and you still won't understand. Mm. Mm. So maybe if you talk like that, that's what exactly Something to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, then yeah, this comes around and so there are a couple of challenges that we had to go through, mm. like working on like this collaborative project that involved lots of people from different I parts know. of the world. 
and yeah, bringing them together to come and make sure this project has, we see this project through. And it's been a long time coming because how long have we been working on this? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the film had its genesis in 2016, in the winter of uh, the January of 2016, when I was back in the UK for, uh, for Christmas. Mm. And I went out to see a movie with Dan Moss, the director. And we just started talking about, come on, let's do this, you know? Like, so Dan Moss, the British director, had actually lectured at Kampala Film School. Oh, oh. Uh, like, I invited him over like he's the godfather of my daughter and things so he he would he was staying with us and i'm like dude do something useful and so he he was lecturing but he was a brilliant teacher actually oh okay so we d we talked about it from 2016 and then one year later we'd finished the script we'd put this crew together we got some funding and actually one year to do all the script development your basic funding your mm. team building your locations mm -hmm. we did all of that inside of one year which for a feature film is not so bad yeah. I can imagine that, but when you sat down, you like straight away knew that you're going to have to do some bits of it in Uganda. Actually, we were going to do all of it in Uganda. So how did India come in the picture? Oh, man, we kind of hustled. Mm. So originally, the idea was that we were going to shoot some shots in London, very, very few. And then we were going to fake India by filming in Western Uganda, but putting signs up in Hindi, mm. finding Indian actors, mm. Mm. Uh, putting cows in the shop <laughs> that oh, looked like okay, Indian okay. cows. Yeah. But in the end, uh, we managed to find a tiny budget from one of our well-wishers. Mm. He added on a, you know, a couple of thousand dollars, and that was enough to actually fly the, a tiny crew over and get mm. the Indian footage shot for real in India. Wow. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, so Daniel, I know David might have stayed here for this long. Mm. He feels like Ugandan, he feels like Mutoro and all that, like he said. But it doesn't take away the fact that he is Muzungu mm -hmm. and you know how they, they approach to things. Mm -hmm. So what was that experience like working with him and Dan and Nicholas? <laughs> <laughs> I would okay. like to know that experience. So, so, I'm worried uh, now. You, 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 Uganda has rubbed off on David so much that uh, you can, you might not tell the difference oh. in uh, working together. But, um, okay, what it brings on the table, for example, now, um, we, we both had a dream to get somewhere, had a plan, which mine was mainly the business end of movies and mm -hmm. film and that, that. But I was there and I was like, okay, I need a movie. So, and it kind of just fell on my lap and I finally got a movie because then that would help me to develop what my, my distribution plan would be mm. later on. So, as the, for starters, like the dream was there and the drive, but I, then I didn't have a film to distribute and I couldn't get any other film. I needed a proof of concept for myself mm. on the projects that I am what I was involved in with. So this one comes up and it is actually something that was like godsend and you're like, this is amazing. So you get the opportunity. And at first I was actually supposed to be working as I don't know, what, what was the first role I go to? Uh, I can't remember, but you do need to explain one thing. Mm. To clarify, Daniel wanted to set up a music distribution company mm. and kind of come and make movies monetizable, commercial mm. yeah. in Uganda. Like, we were all frustrated with the lack of business skill in the movie industry. Mm. Yeah. And actually, oh at Kampala Film School, one of the first things I was really trying to push for was to unite the business department mm. so students who are studying business would interact with the students doing film and they would even sit on each other's modules. Entertainment okay. business. And so, so you set up an entertainment business module out of the, that combination. Okay. And that's what we need. That's what Daniel's aim has always been. Yeah, and that's been my aim is like not to do this for a very long time where everybody's like, we do this with love and love and like, like there is enough it's, injecting love is enough. Mm. So um, now the thing is, like my experience working with David is like, okay, for where he comes Not from. Not only David Dunn. Yes, David all, everybody now. Yes. So the thing is, like the co-production actually opened up uh, possibilities. Mm. Now the story might have been written by David and Dunn, but it puts us in a position where we're like, okay, we're making a Ugandan film. Now what that does is like, okay, the British part of uh, the film mm. actually gave us access to to what to funding which the Ugandan side we couldn't raise. I know, because that's we, my, we, yes. my next question actually. Okay, we couldn't so raise. I was, I was, uh, what was the most difficult part raising the funds to do Imperial Blue? So, <coughs> with uh, fundraising, you first of all need to know your, uh, you need to have an idea of your final budget. Okay. And we were completely inexperienced, you know? Mm. Uh, I've, I've worked in different sectors throughout my life, and I'm like now, I'm not going to give my age away, but I'm no spring chicken. 
and I'm coming to the movie industry like halfway through my life. Okay, so you were telling and me that, I know you already said that yeah. this is like your first future. Yeah, so we had no idea. So, so what, we, what we had so an is idea this like of... like a, a kind of business mindset or uh, is there I, a film? The bad like thing is, not, like, Daniel wants to be a businessman. I'm a kind of failed businessman. And Dan, Dan Moss is like, he doesn't really know about the business. So none of us were like actually experienced film industry professionals. Oh, okay. mm. But Dan Moss had had a lot of experience working on mm. other people's films, mm. both as a creative director and as like a runner and as a lighting guy and whatever. But let me get straight to your question. If you don't know what your final budget is, it's like uh, if you're going out to eat dinner, how much money do you put in your pocket? You don't it know. depends on where you're going to have dinner. Uh -huh. Now, you think, I'm going to go to chicken tonight, yeah. but you end up at Prunes or you end up at Sheraton. That was the situation we found ourselves in. We turned up with like, you know, a 10K budget for a, a 1 million K meal. And so we started off with seed funding. You call it seed funding, yeah? Tiny, tiny bit of funding from a well-wisher. We put that into a campaign to raise more money, like a, a, a GoFundMe campaign. You call it what? Uh, crowdsourcing. Crowdfunding. Crowd, crowdfunding, where we made a video, hey, give, please, give, give us, us just, yeah, you know, $10. Like, and like our presidential candidate was doing the Katumba thing. Um, I think, um, <laughs> yeah, like, but for film, it's just like you reach out to a number of people. And people react and to you. Yeah, yeah. Like, but then yeah. you have to also promote it amongst your circles and, and some other people can like, yeah, it's like, okay, yeah, this looks like a good film. this is way before you even have, you this have the story at this point. It, yeah, so we'd written half of the, we'd, most of the script, this is mid-2016. Okay. We started making the fundraising videos, we got our seed funding, we're pushing it out there, we kept on doubling our money. Then we're like, okay, we got like maybe 70% of what we thought we needed. Mm. Then I went to a, a more like an angel investor or a venture capitalist kind of guy and said, look, this is how we're going to do it. And he topped up and gave us the rest of what we needed to, to actually shoot the film. So it took oh. us about three or four months to fundraise. Mm. And I mean, I'm not going to share the figures with you, but they were like, it was so low for a British film. To, it would be the same as shooting a kind of posh music video. And we were intending to shoot a 90 minute feature with, with the same money it would cost to shoot an expensive music video in the UK, literally. Wow, wow. So now, but in Uganda, the great thing here is that a lot of the costs are lower. Mm. So even though we paid the crew like reasonably well, like no one was really dissatisfied. Uh, at the same time, we did manage to shoot on a fraction of what it would have cost in the UK or US or Japan. You know what I mean? Mm. So that was one of the key advantages. We thought, and this is a lesson for any Ugandan filmmaker, is if you can fundraise outside Uganda and you're telling investors, we're going yeah, to shoot the connections, this. my God. Mm. The connections. Yeah, 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 but yeah, it's not. It's, 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 but remember, it's, this is our first film. It's not like it we... It is your first film, but yeah. you are exposed. You're, you're not Ugandan for starters. Sure, but actually that is a disadvantage because more recently, I have met so many people who want to fund African film. You I'm have? serious. Okay. Yeah, I've been, we've been attending big conferences, film festivals, uh, the market, film market at Cannes okay. in France, we went mm -hmm. to in 2019. When they saw I was white, they're like, ah, go away. They wanted to meet African filmmakers. They should and come here. No, and that's they the don't know who problem. to talk to. <laughs> no, the problem we have is also that uh, uh, we as Africans, Ugandans, and the, like, the rest of Africa as well, is like we, we, we are very immobile. We mm. can't travel. Mm. And even traveling, like someone is like, let's say you have two, two trips in two weeks. And someone like you go to a, an embassy, they take your passport for, for a month. Mm. So you, that means you're locked down, you can't move, you can't do anything. And then they ask for all these things, please present us with this, give us this, give us that. But you can't nip in and like, oh, let me go to, the, to London for a business meeting and then come back maybe tomorrow. Like if we can get that mobility among us mm. ourselves and also be able to travel and be available in these places where these decisions get made. Now, if I give you an example, if you went to Z Zanzibar Film Festival, mm. which is just down the road in yeah. Tanzania, yeah. so you'd be like, how many Ugandans do you actually find there? Not many, because people, again, can't afford to travel and things like that. If you went to, what's the Durban Diff mm. Film Festival? Mm. It's, it's, it's in South Africa. Mm. And the flight people costs, still can't afford to travel. Yeah, mm. and people still can't. Now, even South, South, I, think South that, that, I think that is brought about by the fact that even the movies or the films they're making at this point, they're not mm. earning from them. Yeah, and, and yeah, that's because of it. the resources are not available to even afford to travel. But, but look at what you yeah. just said, it's a vicious circle. Because yeah. you can't go to the place to get funding because mm. you can't make films of quality. Mm -hmm. You get me? It's a vicious circle. Yeah. So the way to break out of that is co-productions, right? Mm. So 
partnering like an East African film company, partnering with a European film company, for example, like we did, or it could mm. be American, it could be Japanese, yeah. but that, those partnerships, the one half supplies some of the concepts, some of the funding, the other half supplies like the crew that's like talented but not going to cost you the same as an American crew, you get me? Mm. So you're both coming in and putting something of equal value on the table. And I think it's fair to say, I don't, Daniel might contradict me, but I think it's fair to say that it was a democratic production. It wasn't like, okay, the director is the boss, so you have to do what the director says on set. Mm. But offset, like Daniel had as much power as I did, but because he knew the territory better than us. He yes. could hustle in local languages. So he had power more, more than us. I offset. understand, but mm. uh, you see, at some point it can also be a danger. Because mm. when you trust a Ugandan, I am in London and I'm proud to be. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes if I end up, I, I don't know, I, we've lost it that, on, on that point. No, I disagree. We never had any of those problems of no, embezzlement. Because Daniel, Daniel is, uh, is not Ugandan. He is very Ugandan. <laughs> he is uh, <laughs> such a waka waka. <laughs> I'm very, okay. Now the thing is, um, it, it, it comes down to things like um, compensation and also the opportunity. Now, most people you get... Well, like, maybe it comes down to professionalism. No, even professionalism. But the thing is that most things, that, the best thing that would mitigate everything, like let's say, for example, it's a, it's a gig. Mm. It's going to come and go. Mm. You get? Mm. Ah, so it's like, let me rip as much as possible out of this, mm. you get? Mm. Now, this comes in as like, it's a project that... Five years. Like, you, it's five years in, 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 in the making, you get? So, yeah. like... What's the, what's the point in not giving all your all to see this happen? So it's like it's like your baby. And now, for, for, for me, I got the opportunity where we, was, uh, we were on a film and we partnered and we were equal partners on the movie. It's like decisions got me. Because there are certain things that I had to make the decision for because, because depending on the circumstances, I was actually the only person who could actually make that decision. And then we would sit down, we would discuss, and like have a back and forth. And this, uh, like it's, it was just equal partners. Now the problem that we have is like most of the other projects that we get, like let's say international and stuff like that. Mm. It's like people come in and then you are like assistant of assistant of the assistant, of the assistant. Mm. and then some people like some guy was telling me like when they were shooting um, Last King of Scotland, mm. they were hired as Ugandan crew, but they never made it on set. They were always put in a, a tent somewhere far away from where they were what they were shooting, but they were there. And then I think uh, Queen of Katwe kind of brought people closer, a little bit closer, because some, cause some roles some Ugandans had gotten, but they were also still in the assistant work department. So it's, it's, these things is like, so for us we use the project to train up talent and be okay. sure like at least let's get, um, build up the talent. Because again, when you look at film, when speaking in the distribution terms, it's like you have to have a certain quality of film for you to be able to sell it. If your film doesn't meet the standard that is required now that comes back into you need to know the budget that you need yes. so for example before even you start to shoot you need to know that netflix no, has for a, us we have the faith has a list what, of what cameras happens here is uh, i i feel like i want to make a movie mm -hmm. i can write so i start writing mm -hmm. i don't even know what i'm writing about but i'm just but, writing. but you're just right you don't know who the audience is going to mm -hmm. be you, you don't, don't know where you're going to set it exactly. or you're just like you know what let me make a move but then you'll find that netflix will tell you these are the requirements that we have and it's like a 400 page book you're like oh damn how am i going to ever meet all of these and then by and you have your film fi finished and you're like praying can i get it into maybe there and, and everybody's looking at it and they're like no this is yeah. like it doesn't meet the standard that's why david said that we can't even go to these festivals mm. because we don't even have quality movies like it's things are changing on a mm. number of levels mm. first of all access to very professional equipment it's never been easier. Yes, yeah, very like, And so you can get your hands on something to shoot in 4K relatively easily. There's very good companies, like I don't mind mentioning Cams and Grips. Mm. Uh, yeah, Cinema Gear with, House with, You know, and like these guys, what are they called? They changed the name to Cinema Gear House. Cinema Gear House. Mm. Like that company is like run by a saint. He's mm. made a very good equipment available at a lower cost. Is it and it's, in no, it, it's a mixed team. It's a Belgian guy and a Ugandan manager. Okay. And they, they're making like low cost professional equipment available to, to anybody, pretty much at a price any serious filmmaker could afford here. Yeah? Wow. So stuff like that. And then you look at other experienced people coming in and trying to support the industry one way or another. Mm. Now where Daniel's trying to come in is to try and set up 
a more commercialized approach to sales. Where so this comes, gets back, paid. this yeah. comes back to your point about what do Netflix want? How do we get into festivals? Mm. We, we are hoping to be part of uh, a growing understanding of how Uganda and independent filmmakers can crack the industry, even on a relatively low budget film. And to go back to your earlier point, is the quality there? Yeah, I think it is. I think like there's talented directors out there, Matt Bish, Dylan Dilla, like uh, Esteri Tabandeki is getting into directing. You know, there's actually, when you start to look at it, there's so much talent in Uganda in terms of understanding of how to make good films that could succeed at festivals. Yeah. Uh, and and, and this is because like, we need to lift the pressure off of everybody because someone comes into this film and you're like, okay, I'm going to write my film. Like all the responsibility is on you, you get. And like that, that, that weight, if it can get lifted off of someone's shoulder with a proper working. Yeah, in but the, Daniel, I agree mm. with you, but it doesn't work like that here. And what you're going to set is mm. the director who wrote the film, is the producer, he is the... Casting director, he, he but is. But wh why is that? Because it, again, comes back to the same, same thing here. Yeah. You see here. So, there. so it, the thing is, it's like you will do everything and make it a one-man crew. Now you will find that most of our films blow through the budget right after the film is done. There's no budget for editing, so the director is going to do it himself. There's no budget yes. for the rest. You're going to yes. do all that for your, yourself. And then again, you'll be like, okay, the film is done. Now where can I show it? You get. So now, Paul Magic is, has helped. They have come in mm. and they're giving us hope. And uh, people will, okay, this is where we can get our materials to. But the thing is, like again, co-production open up the rest of the world to you as well. And even even if I it's, think it's we should encourage. I don't know. If, I don't know what how to do it or how mm. who to talk to. But I think we should encourage this co-production thing because I think it will yeah, help us. The co-production thing now is like film is Ugandan British. That means you already have the British uh, audience. You have the Ugandan audience. You see. Now that is a start. Then you can reach out to the rest of the world. So, and even if it's, it's not a co-production and it's an entirely Ugandan film, if you make a story that is global enough for someone to watch and relate with it wherever they are in the world, mm -hmm. it should be able to appeal to anyone, anywhere. Even if someone is in Australia or Alaska, they should be able to understand the film and yeah. like it. I think, so, but to mm. pick up on that point, because there's something that we haven't really mentioned. Mm. And okay, there's one thing to cut corners on set and for the director to also be cleaning the toilets. Mm. We all know about that. Mm. But when we look at pre-production, for me, this is one of the biggest uh, periods of filmmaking where it gets compromised. It's the most important period where mm. compromises get made. And I would start with the script, and I would also start with like, kind of, Hiring actors because they're your friends or because you want to... I was to, just about to ask know. that. I was going to ask you, how did you actually come up with your cast? Well, we did a proper I casting. Saw, uh, I saw Abin Chibi, yeah. I, saw, uh, I saw Rema, I saw Ruth, I saw... There's this other gentleman, the pastor. Andrew Ben and Kibuka. Uh, Andrew Ben and Kibuka. Yeah. So I'm wondering, how did you actually do your casting? We, Was it Daniel that actually handled that? Well, we had a very, a we very a good casting call. People came. The director we was had, there. We had a really good. We wanted. also had a good casting agent and mm. casting director, Sharon mm. Sharon Gaita, and mm. she was very good. And she even got us in into an interview with Bobby Wine. Nice. So it was only a few months before he actually ran for MP. Oh. And at that point, I think he didn't quite know whether he was which way he was going. Okay. So he agreed, and he looked at the script. He loved it. He was like, uh, "Yeah, I would love to come and audition." And I'm like. You don't need to audition, you can, you can just have the part. You know, and it, that's where the problem is. But you, yeah? Okay, so I'm that's guilty. That's a business decision. I, I, I'm, I, I'm guilty, of, <laughs> but he was the only one, I think. And, but, Why would but, but listen to what he said, yeah? So I said, come on, you know, just, 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 just sign here, you know? And then he was like, no. And he's like, I'm not coming in as Bobby Wine. You don't know who I am. I'm Robert Chagulani, and, and I'm going to audition with everyone that's else. Nice. I was like, what? Well, I, I was so humbled. I mean, he is very much, a, he's the business, real deal. That's what actually happened. Here, mm. as in, if I had a set, I am preparing to shoot and I am casting, and then you mm. turned up, I'll definitely do exactly what you wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You yeah. understand? Yeah, yeah. But, but then again, also, you think about these things is like now, again, as we've been maneuvering through the distribution world, yes. you come up with the obstacle after obstacle after yes, obstacle. Yes. Like, now, there's one where they say, name after. Yeah. Now imagine if we had had Bobby White in the movie. Right. Ah, we would have and, been in like, and then we are cinemas. coming, we are releasing now. Like just, just think about that. You yeah, see? Yeah. So they ask you for a name actor. And yeah. So we, we and now for the thing is we can even dream bigger. The other day we were just uh, dreaming and we were like, we need to tap Daniel Kaluuya for a Ugandan no, film. No, I'd and, like to be part of that. Yeah. And see, why it's not? like and why not? Because if you're watching Daniel, we're coming for you. <laughs> So it's like we just need to come up with a story, yeah. which we already have, mm -hmm. and um, 
this piece together and find ways to get him on board. So, so, so then you're working with, uh, with, uh, with, with David, Dan, Moss, and Nicholas. What lessons have you learned? Because I know this was like literally your first future, mm. and you're working with these big, big names. Ah. And <laughs> can, can we put it in, in context <laughs> for you? Let me put it in context. We, we all started out like, okay, everybody had their own experiences, yeah. and then we came together yeah. and as, as amateur as we were. Mm -hmm. But these, these are people who had, uh, we had a love for what we were going to do and what we were venturing into. So it's not like, ah, oh, it's big money. It's like, yeah. We all learned, because, okay, I, I, as he said, he came into um, at the lecture. As a lecturer at the school, Dan Moss also lectured at the school. I was a student there, and uh, maybe that's the level of seniority that we had. But I absorbed the, the information, and I think maybe I caught up to them while I was there. And then when we got to this project, it's, it was now like it was a level a level field. It's slightly a bit of like the director had worked on a couple of projects. Mm -hmm. Now me and David we had been doing our thing here and there, yeah. and so it opened the field. And it's like now we just had to absorb and learn on the way as, as we go on. So. So many things went wrong, so many things like you couldn't get the figures right, you didn't know which people to call. It's like and now you, you're calling someone to get you a number of somebody and get, get you like, okay. So, so it's all this and it was all happening in Uganda, you get, where I've, I've grown up and have the experience and he has moved, uh, has been adopted by the country. So that created that equal ground where we had to all move together and learn. But yeah. Um, I think the, the biggest culture clash mm. was cooking food food oh. so we had like uh on the set was um a ca the cinematographer mm. and his assistant who he, he insisted in bringing and they were both like vegan they don't eat anything like they don't even animal eat eggs products. they don't even eat cheese eggs milk mm. they no animal product so cooking for those vegans and daniel dan moss the director is also vegetarian and then, so the first days you'd be serving and then like all the meat eaters are complaining, where's the beef, you know? And so the next day you, you, you cook posho and beans, you know, you know what I mean? And then the, the, the vegetarians even start complaining, what's this? I don't like this. And you know, people just complain non-stop on the food. It was yeah, culture food clash, was just start to pain. finish. And now you'd cook for, the, yeah, now it's like, ah, vegetarians and vegans, Ugandan food is mainly vegetable, you're like, no, we are good. And then you'd be like, okay. You've sorted the, the meat problem, animal products, you're like, sour. And then someone's like, your food is too heavy. Yes. And then when you cook lighter food like spaghetti, what, then the Ugandans are like, so, uh, oh, let, me let, 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 me, let me ask uh, David, yeah. was Nicholas new in Uganda, as in was this his yeah. first time to come yeah, to Uganda? It was, Uganda his, it was his first time in Africa. Oh. And um, he struggled at the beginning. I mean, I, I love Nick, but at the beginning we were like, oh, is, is he going to last, you know? Because he, first of all, the first night he was in Kampala, he, he had a fight with a kitten, a baby cat, and it bit him. Oh. <laughs> and we can laugh about it now, but at the time he freaked out. He got bitten by a kitten and then insisted, I need a rabies jab. And, uh, but, you know, uh, fair enough, it's your first night in Africa, you get bitten by an animal. But we're like, Nick, it's a kitten. It's not like you got bitten by a hyena or a... I know. You know? Mm. So, but I think it was psychological. It was just, you know, and then... I know how it feels when So, but our, the problem was, after that, we didn't take any complaints seriously. So when he genuinely got malaria and typhoid, he was, like, dying. And we were like, ah, shut up. Stop it's complaining. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Man up. Man up. Man up or get off set, you okay. know? Mm. Yeah. So, uh, we're going to go for a short break. When we come back, we're going to talk more about your casting. And mm. then we're going to talk about exactly why, what can we do as an industry to get on that level? Mm. Maybe we, we lack access to some of these things. But we'll get back. Now stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. I'm still with Daniel and David. And we're talking about Imperial Blue movie making. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. This is the real Africa, the most beautiful place in okay, the world. Okay, okay, I've seen the Lion King. <laughs> this is a small vulnerable community, and it is my duty to protect it. If you take me to where you make it, you will have a lot more than a thousand dollars coming in. This drug is insane. You see your own future.
something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue. Filmmaking generally, but most importantly right now we are talking about Imperial Blue, the movie that is going to be premier premiering this weekend, guys. You wait for the details about the premiere, but right now I am not going to talk about it as in Africa. I'm going to go down to Uganda. In your opinion, I think our creatives have little or no access to skills needed to compete internationally. What do you think we should do or can be done by our filmmakers or our creatives? to earn a place or to compete, to be able to compete internationally. Shall I go first? Um, yeah. yeah okay. um, so let me just give you a simple story. Um, uh, we were on set and uh, the DOP, I asked the DOP a question about the camera. Mm. And because in my past life I was also a DOP, so I was like, I, I, I understand these things. So he started speaking, I was like, okay, I've heard enough. He's like, the things he told me, I couldn't understand. Now, most of us have like the terminologies, the word, color science, things like we, we don't delve into that much mm. to understand how to create a moving picture. Mm. So he, he shared that knowledge with me and I was like, I, I, do this, I, I didn't realize like, I don't know that much about that in the entire field. Mm. And so I feel like for us to get there again, it's not, we need to plan and make, um, put in place ways we can train up um, and professionalize. Now first would be having schools. Mm. Now the schools that we have, again, because film education is very expensive, the funding is, is not that great for them to be able to survive. You see like everything we're talking about is developing around what? Around money. Yeah. So uh, the, expense, the expenses to run a film school, um, like creating good comprehensive film modules for students to actually learn. And, and, and like get the true knowledge because I understand we can go to the universe on YouTube and get get to figure all this stuff out and self taught and maybe learn because mm. you know, most of most of us that's how we learn exactly and most of us exactly most of us is the way we, we got the education <laughs> yeah but you 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 your you learning gets cut at a certain point you get because you know someone will ask you a difference between someone who's gone to like school to study. Um, something and someone who just learned it maybe like because mm -hmm. the one who studied it intensively and deeply you do understand the science of how it functions you get and if, let's say it's an art and someone just figured out uh, get the camera here set up a nice picture so you know you just know the art and that's how you can do it but the science of the science behind everything mm -hmm. is what that usually lacks and now if you look at the with, with like where we have got it right now the quality of the production that we have in Uganda like, mm -hmm. yeah we've got it to a point but then you get to a point when you're watching this film that they're not that captivating or even memorable because then the, the problem comes back down to like writing. Mm, script. You know, script. Mm. It's just, just as simple as that. And like the picture is amazing. Everything is nice. But now... Now you lose the story. Yeah, Taylor, mm. you tailoring in those things that like play with human emotion. So someone will tell you like you, you need to understand human psychology for you to be able to write a story that will you build up tension and then you drop that and then you surprise someone, you know, like you get so you, you, you build the tension and then at the end, boom, comes with the surprise. So it's, it's like all those dynamics that happen in the art of storytelling. Mm. Now, those, those, those having the understanding to write like that is yeah, lacking. And so, if we, so, so, so that's, that's exactly the simplest thing. I would, I would say also like workshops, you know, like uh, developing a script and developing the ideas on the film, uh, you know, the, the going into the story, but then also like what kind of film are we making here? 
Is it going to like look like a Schwarzenegger film, or is it going to look like uh, you know a kitchen sink drama, like an everyday drama? You know, what, what's what's your genre? All of these things. I think once you start to actually think about where you're going to sell your film, who is going, who is my audience? Where am I going to sell this? That's where you can start to build like character around the whole production. That the whole production takes on its own themes, its own character. You're vibing like you. Okay, we're making this kind of movie. So I think, unfortunately, if there's not enough pre-production, like thought, it's not money that goes into pre-production, it's thought and time, time. and workshop. Time. And, and ma taking time to build up the film before you've even like, hired your camera, before you've even cast your actors, mm -hmm. you know exactly what the film is going to look like. That, I think, is half of the story. I think, I, I think that's not so common here. Again, it comes down to, I can write storytelling, because you'll find like maybe most people who write and who have written script or stuff like that, their education was from English class. And eh, write composition, composition writing. Remember composition mm, writing? Mm. We used to write composition. Someone's like, yeah, I can write a composition, I can write a script. And then you go with that. But again, like, again I was trying to say, is like, I, like someone who teaches you the arts, yeah? Like there are simple things that they need to explain to you the three act structure and how like what do you want your story to do? At some point where do you want your actors to go? What, what do you want to do with them? When you get to understand all those things and then even the visual language. Because you see the camera and someone can put it there and press record. But mm. in film, everything the camera does influences how the audience feels, even if they don't know it. True. So the camera movement, like the visual language itself mm. inspires you to stay in and within the story and not take you out. The sound design, the music, the choice of music and what you wanted to do. So and again, you, 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 like you're saying, thought. You're at this point where you're sitting and thinking, I want my film to sound like this. Then you think about the sound. How am I going to achieve what that? What do I need to yes, achieve so, this? Yes, what do I need yeah. to achieve it? Like, and then what is my sound going to be doing? You know? So it's also like, I want the audience to feel um, like maybe sad and then you choose the right music that gives but not not only music, you know. It's also you're you're recording the atmosphere, well, you're, but you're recording the noise in the scene around. Mm -hmm. Like uh, so, you're recording the atmosphere there. So if you're shooting a bar scene, you need all the sounds of a bar going on in the background, very realistically, because even if, like Daniel said, even if you don't quite know why you're feeling this way, when you're watching a movie, if you hear things like bottles clinking in the background, people mm -hmm. cracking jokes, you feel like you're really in a bar. And, and that attention to sound design is very important and it's what's lacking in a lot of low budget films. But in reality, it doesn't cost a lot to do it. So, uh, so you think <coughs> we are not trained well? I think I there's techniques. Know, I, I know there are some people that have invested, okay, not really filmmakers, but they go to Dubai, they do their chair. You mm. know what chair is, right? The what chair? Oh yeah, the work, working abroad, yeah. jobs abroad. <laughs> yes, doing yeah. jobs abroad and then someone has always had this dream of filmmaking mm. and then when he gets here, he doesn't even want to take time to understand what is, what do I need to do. Mm. I need this profession, I need the other. So he thinks he can actually do it because he thinks he has the money. But I am thinking we lack the, the knowledge. Listen, it's, it's simple. Training. It's half of the story is what Daniel said earlier is like good film schools, but the other half of the story, or more than half, is experience on a professional set. Like I emphasize, this was our first film, but Dan Moss, the director, had spent a lot of time on professional sets, and he'd done sound design for many, many short films. He knew what was involved. He had that experience, but uh, it's not like Dan Moss was this sort of angel who came down and was like full of knowledge. No, he, we were also hustling together. But what you realize very quickly is like, if I don't do, add in these certain elements, my film will not stand up on an international level. If the sound design is not there, if the acting is whack, if the script doesn't go anywhere, meanders, if the lighting looks cheap and fake, if the makeup isn't perfect, you know, the minute you make one hole in the illusion, then the audience is like, ah, it's fake. So it ha that films are total experiences. So every element of it has to be in place. It doesn't have to be expensive or perfect, but it has to be well done. You being Ugandan, how would you advise a Ugandan filmmaker out there? Because it was your first project, but you seem to have, 
you, there's, there's a level you are at at this point that as I cannot compare you with someone who has done a couple of them, I mean, it's not my place to judge or, or compare or mm. do what. But I, from what I've had, I've, I've had so many film directors, you know, producers on the show. Mm. But uh, with your experience right now that you have right now and your, your five-year goals that are coming, maybe the next projects that are coming, how would you talk to a Ugandan filmmaker out there probably watching this show? How would you advise him? Like, he's thinking of working on his next project. What would be the tips? Okay. Um, honestly, um, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I would start with the script, you know, because that's where you're going to sell your film first to partners, right? So, like, getting a big name actor on board. Actors love playing cool roles, you know, if you're an actor, you, you know, you, you don't want to be playing some badly written part in a, in a rubbish story. So, but when you get, and a lot of scripts out there are terrible. Even Hollywood scripts are not that always great. So when a good script lands on your table, you want to work on it. And that goes for the whole cast and crew. So I would say start with the script and get it amazing. Make it unmissable. For me, what my advice would be is that um, I've seen filmmakers out there have done amazing work with the limited resources. Mm. Like already you're fighting a boxing match with your hand tied behind your back mm -hmm. and put it there. But the most amazing thing is the fact that they've been able to get the work out there. Most people have all these brilliant ideas and they're like, oh my God, I'm, I, 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 I want to do this film until I have this. And then it never comes. Mm. So that procrastination where it's like, okay, I'll, get, I'll do it with this camera, I'll do it with this camera. Mm. And then you find like, they never do it. They never do it. But you have the, 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 the young and all the, all the filmmakers in Uganda who have put out their work and they've done amazing things. Like for me, what I would say is like kudos to them and they've been able to achieve what they've achieved with all the limited resources and all the limitations mm. that they face. Mm -hmm. And that is pretty much amazing. And I'm actually very much inspired by them. Yes. So, um, and I really think like if you can achieve that, there is nothing much I can advise, but uh, speaking of, I mean, I, I want to talk to, again, the, the distribution money audience, yes, right? Yes, it yes, says, Like now, know the audience that you're reaching out to. Educate yourself, that is key. Educate yourself. Uh, even if like the internet is here, Google, you can ask Google anything. So it's like educate yourself and figure out, because at some point we all need to um, leave ourselves by uh, the bootstraps and reach out to audiences that will actually remit funds I think that brings us. us down to, like David said, the story, writing, as in the script itself. But then uh, if you're going to do something that is, uh, for example, between British and Uganda, I think you have to look at something that is easily relatable. Yeah. So look at music. music musicians in Uganda figure it out. They are paid. And, like, and if you look at that, it's, 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 it's something that's really funny. It's like people talk about entertainment industry, entertainment industry. Mm. Musicians are rich. They are. I think most are faking. Compared to filmmakers. Yeah, compared to filmmakers. Yeah. Compared, like, compared, yeah. To, compared to filmmakers. Yes. 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 Now, you see, the film industry in Uganda has been built by funding money, grants here, mm. here and off of that backbone is like we've gotten people who have come up in this industry, like squeezing, like fighting and scavenging for the little that we can to come up with these films. And so things like uh, festivals, going out festivals and hoping to get that one connect that will get you to work. But at the other side, like coming back to musicians, musicians know where their audience is. Like in Uganda, you go to, when you come back to film, the production costs and expenses are quite a bit higher. Okay? So from producing the movie and shooting it and then marketing it and things like that. So you have uh, bigger costs to make the product. Yeah, but I think like David said in the first place, as in we do not know how to plan. Because we don't look at it in that direction as in distribution bit of it. I'll be like, mm. ah, I think when I get there, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Mm. But in the beginning, you just hear like you want to film. And that's why they settle for anything that is available. In the beginning, someone writes a story and they have in mind a location. 
and if they don't get this location, they set up whatever they can get, and then that kills the story at the end of the day, right? Maybe. I mean, I think also, though, you know, to deal with that last point, filmmaking, particularly low-budget filmmaking, is hustling. So you can't find this location, you, you do you that way. You can't get this actress, it. you'll go for this guy. You'll even change the gender because you, you ended up with, <laughs> So, you know, so there's, there's a strong <laughs> element of hustling. But looping back to the, the point you were making and mm. Daniel was describing, the, the kind of topsy-turvy world of Ugandan film, mm. it starts with like an idea and you just blunder forward. Whereas, and I'm, I'm not, there's nothing wrong with that because actually that ends up with some genius things and you know, Wakaliwood was a happy accident and there's been some interesting moments of Ugandan cinema, very, very interesting. But what I would also say is that we ought to think more like Hollywood. We ought to think more like the professional industry where you mm. actually start with sales. You start with distribution. You go to a distributor and say, I have this project. I want to get this and this actors on, on board. Wouldn't that be great that you could go to an investor and say, here's my business plan. I want to get this and this actor on board. We're going to distribute it worldwide throughout the diaspora. We're going to get this and this and this festivals. Mm. We're going to do a limited cinema run in Nigeria. We're going to do a limited run in London or wh whatever you've identified your key partners yes. for screenings. We don't have that. Yeah. You, and you, you, work, in, have you that. work in reverse order of chronology I'm of time. You, David, we you, don't have that. No, but there's no reason why you shouldn't. It's basically yeah, it's kind of what we're doing. Yeah. We are reaching out to the cinemas in Kenya and um, Tanzania, but because the, the branch that Century Cinemas has mm. in this region is like they go as far as South Africa, and they like, okay, why didn't I make a film? Now, the only problem that the cinema will have, and it's very much um, viable, is they do not trust that your film will make money. So, screening a movie and then they have like one person in there, mm. okay, so then you come back to market. Mm. Please tell people about the film and let people know so that they can like, be ready. Like, you see, how movies come to cinemas as like Fury, um, F9, Furious, uh, whatever. Mm. Fast and, and Furious. furious. furious is coming out, but everybody has been like, oh my god, we are waiting. So that culture of like the high, the, the, the thing is like, I, I'm also thinking about like, for example, how um, musicians, Kulanga, they are beautiful. Yes. Okay, you see like that hype. But we don't have the habit here, because now it brings me the next question, because you guys, I, I think from, I was actually honored to be part of the people that were, came for this, the press screening. Mm. And I'm going to ask the question, but I, before I ask that question, whereby when, 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 what do you want the person that is going to be watching this movie to learn from it? That's my next question. But before that, we do not have that culture here, whereby we do not support our own. I, I, I hate I, to put it like that. Yeah, I think, I, I think you're being negative. Because, <laughs> forgive me for saying that. Because of course, you, people know how to plan. You know, like, I, this is a brutal comparison, but farmers plan. Farmers are the best planners, you know? So if you know how to farm, you can probably, like, be on the, the financial department of one of my films. Because if you know how to sow seeds, then you can know how to train people, you can know how to prepare for your future. That's all it is. So now, for example, we've, we've learned the hard way, but, you know, we now have contacts for distribution. We now understand who to contact internationally to get your film on Netflix, Amazon mm. Prime, and these things. Mm. I will warn you that not, Netflix does not accept every film. Everything, yeah. But they are getting more and more interested in Africa. And so, you know, fight, if we um, idiot amateurs, virgins like us can do it, and I, you know, people might be looking at this, oh, he's some middle-aged white guy, he's lying. Yeah. I'm telling you the truth, I do not know a goddamn thing about feature filmmaking until I came to this project. You know, my early, I used to write film scripts that had ridiculous scenes of car chases and helicopters, stuff that no one can afford. Now I've realized from this filmmaking experience, what is affordable when you're writing a script and also the potential to get it out to the international market, whether you're African, whether you're Indian, whether you're Muzungu, it's the same thing basically. Now, the number one thing I would say, I want to actually answer the question, what is the one thing I would do uh, differently. You said to da Daniel, what's the one piece of advice you would give? For me, it's cast. If you have a famous actor, like get a famous actor. You could write a part for that Only actor. Only if you can afford that. Famous no, but you, because people want to come and work in Africa. Oh. Um, like my next project, which I can't talk about too much, but it's a mm -hmm. Kenyan, Kenyan kind of uh, crime thriller. Okay. We have a very famous actor from the US and he's coming on board and this is great and we're not paying him like he will eventually get some reward for it in terms of shares or something mm. but he's asked for no upfront fees he just wants to work in africa trust me 
there are tons of people who just want to come and work here. They will give you their time. It's yeah. So you, you can even try if you want it, you can be like, this way, will you try? Yeah. I, I, I guess now people watching this, filmmakers, guys, reach out to these people, go to Hollywood, talk, find a way of talking to these people. They are yep. out there waiting and willing to come and work in Africa. Wow, that would be nice. Yeah. yeah and the assets, like, you know, sometimes people be like, it's hard to find these people. The assets are available for you to be I think, to, like, I think, I, I think we, we just think they will ask for so much money. It's the way you approach them. Yeah, yeah. I think so, yeah. The, and also the story also... Maybe. Many of them are rich, okay? So then they're not looking at Africa going, hey, I'm going to like, you know, sort of squeeze this little Ugandan, Ugandan production company. <laughs> Most people don't think like that. But many, many, also, it's important to remember, many people have made it in Hollywood, particularly like African-Americans. Mm. Um, they actually feel some kind of debt or some kind of obligation to give back. That Think about like... Forest Whitaker, think about all these people. Mm. You know, they're actually very generous towards the African oh, continent. Forest Whitaker comes to Uganda almost every year. I heard. Yeah. 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 I heard. So it's like, it's, it's the way you approach them, and if the story, the project is something that is really, really cool, mm. ah, someone like, and the potential. Now, again, you, you know, like they say, like, the papers are prepared. It's like if you're ready with everything, and mm. you got a good a, script. There's a plan. Yeah. It's not like that someone is like, okay, let me exact produce this and probably put in some money. Sure. Yeah. They use the, because they're like, this budget is too tiny. Like, this is okay, it's change for them. And then for you, like, oh, this is a big budget. So they're like, yeah, okay. Then they can accept. So I guess we need to explore. Yeah. And get out, out there. Because they're even guilting people in doing things. Because they're living in that age. Mm. Where you're like, yeah. You can guilt trip. Now, can yeah. guilt trip. Yeah. Yeah. But, <laughs> like, uh, that's the budget. Being a, a female DJ now. <laughs> <laughs> of African origin. Sorted. Yeah. And I think yeah. it's, it's sorted. But I want to make one thing, two things clear, actually, very briefly. First of all, the reason why you need that big name mm. is that once you have a big name in your film, like someone who's been in an American series, HBO series, mm. or in a Hollywood movie, then you can sell your film almost anywhere because it's the named actors that sell films. Our film is insultingly called a no-cast film. Of course we have a cast, but outside Uganda, we've got no big names. Within Uganda, we're, you know, it's a very good cast, but outside, not so much. So you need to get that named actor, a recognized actor in your film, and then you can sell your film anywhere. You can even go in the big cinemas in Europe, in America. My second point is, like, the, the way we met the American actor who's going to be in our next Kenyan project, mm was through going to film festivals. The Kenyan director, who's like leading the project, took his previous film around and went to as many festivals as he could. And going to those festivals, you network, you meet people, you yes. meet producers, you meet actors. And if you're an African director, an African filmmaker, the hunger for African content in a, America a real, is huge. Actually, no, 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 put it right. A real African film made of Right. Because there are yeah. fake ones out there. Sure, but I mean, like, even this guy... Something you, you have something to show. You have something decent. You have something quality that has integrity. Yeah. So this Kenyan film director, the, the, the film he took about was a very low budget film, much, much lower budget than Imperial Blue. And it was also his first big project that he'd taken on. It's not, like, going to win any Oscars. But it got a lot of attention from the African-American film community because they're like, wow, here's an authentic Kenyan director who made a film for like nearly no money and it actually looks pretty good. So they were like, let's help this guy. And that's where this Hollywood actor came in and that's how he's jumping on the project. I'm, I'm telling you, this guy, he's a Kenyan guy, young guy like Daniel. He, same street skills, street smarts, hustling. Just be a hustler. So, uh, so back to Imperial Blue movie. Mm. Uh, Daniel, as a Ugandan producer to this movie, mm. what would you like a Ugandan viewer that is going to come, which we are going to talk about, about the premiere, mm. what would you like someone to like take home? Okay, uh, for me... Uh, as in, because from, from the story, from the story, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a British Ugandan fantasy film, but we need to understand exactly what would I understand, what would I take home, because we need to learn from this Okay, um, for me, what I would like to just take back is like we now live in a more global community. Um, you reach out to people as far as on the other side of the world mm. in a second. And so, um, this should help us to, like, for me, what I want the whole village to come is to understand how we can relate better, we can relate with each other better. 
um, appreciate our appreciate our differences so that we can come together as one people and maybe humanity will be one. The world will be a better place for you. Yeah. And yeah, also the other thing I would like is uh, for someone to come to the film and be like, okay, when is the next one? Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, now mm. then, then, then there will be like the break in the distribution chain. It's like, okay, now you deliver this one. Someone's like, okay, where's the next one? And like, ha, now you have to wait there. Tell how long. And so, so that's why we need many other people to be able to supply this content to the Ugandan audience. If, if we give the Ugandan audience quality stuff to watch, they will watch it. And they will go to the cinema and like, is it worth my time? Mm, yeah. sometimes, there are things you turn towards the Ugandan people. I'm really, really yeah. to what you're like, why? You know, I think if you try to be patriotic, but you're like, no, you get, you think that it is that's just bad. But if you give people something like this, like, because you, 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 you waste people's two hours, they're like sitting down to watch your film. It better be worth it. It's like that is time they can't get you back. I know. So it's like make it worthwhile for the audience as well. And give them a little bit more. That's why we all need to come together and be able to channel the TV. And the audience will follow in and eventually you don't have to look at just Uganda because the audience is big. So most of us will be like, oh, but do you have any connections in Kenya? Can you reach out to Kenya to so like the distribution style in mm, Kenya, mm. Tanzania, Zambia, Zimbabwe? Um, you go down south until you hit South Africa. I think, I, I, think, I, I don't know, I, I hate to keep saying we haven't, we haven't, but truth is uh, our writers, like I said earlier, I think they're not targeting the rest of the world. They're still writing for Uganda. Actually, they, 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 they <laughs> but for but for 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 for, uh, for David who has lived here for over fifteen years, married to Ugandan Mutoro, and uh, now half Ugandan, half Mutoro, half British. Uh, uh, what would you uh, want someone who's going to be watching uh, an Imperial Blue to take home with them? There's a strong element of uh, my own life story in Imperial Blue. Oh, okay. And there's also a strong element I think for any uh, white adventurer who comes to Africa. Most of the white man in Africa films style the white man as a hero. But in reality, there are no truly good or truly evil people. We are all Fifty Shades of Grey. Yes. And w I think the message was, on a simple level, was, you know, beware the stranger who comes with promises. And so the kind of, uh, the image of the white man in our film, in Imperial Blue, is not of the heroic colonial adventurer, mm. but the opposite, which is this kind of uh, greedy merchant. He's a, in the movie, the, the hero is like a drug smuggler. Mm. He's, a, he's not a real hero, he's an anti-hero. Mm. So I would want people to come away from that saying, you know, beware the white savior, but at the same time, beware your fellow villagers. Yeah, because yeah. in the movie, uh, as you see, you, as you've yeah, seen, yeah, seen yeah. village life is not put up there as this uh, heaven. You know, village life is also full of backstabbers and, you know, predators yes. and people out to steal each other's yeah, land. Pull into their side, yeah. yeah, and we tried to convey that kind of village drama, but on a bigger scale, on a real feature film scale, showing village life in all of its glory and dirt. Yeah, because in the beginning, mm. in the movie, yeah, we, we look at, at the Bulu, Bulu, Bulu. Bulu, yeah. <laughs> Bulu, that, which is a hub. You can, you can mm. easily see, see your future, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so at least, when I, this guy, this guy was like, oh my God, I must go. It doesn't matter what I have to go through, but I must get this. But mm. he had his intentions, mm. which did not get known to Chisache, right? Mm. So, it's a, like you said, we need to be aware of... Uh, we need to be aware of uh, the white savior, like you put it. Yeah. Yes, we are going to talk about the premiere of Imperial Blue movie that is happening this Saturday, as in today, 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 that's the 6th, right? 5th. Fifth. Fifth, <laughs> sorry, 5th June at uh, Cinemax Cinema Acacia Mall. Uh, so uh, let's talk about it. What, what does one need? What is needed? You know? Okay, so the ticket is uh, 50,000, so if you go there, down there right now, mm. um, Event, yes. and uh, everything is going on like, nicely. And There'll be some celebrities there. Yes. Yeah. 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 But um, the ticket is 50,000 for those who um, 
VIP. Want to attend? Mm. It's fifty flat fee, fifty thousand. Even it's fifty fifty. Yes. There's nothing like ten, twenty. Yeah. Yeah. No, th those ones are later. So we're also running for two weeks. Okay. After this premiere day, and it's more affordable than standard twenty k. All right. For Cinemax, and I really encourage people to see the movie at the cinema. Why? Because the big screen experience, especially seeing Uganda, seeing Fort Porto blown up on a big screen seeing Abu Muchibi and uh, you know Andrew and Benan, and Rahema, Namfuka, and Stereotype and Deki and the sound design, the music from Albert Sempeki who is a Buganda royal musician. S hearing that music on a 5.1 sound system. Wow. It, sure you can watch it at home but this is the experience of a lifetime. No, no, no we have to watch it in the cinema. Please. So it's All running of us two weeks. The cinema to watch this movie you have two weeks. <laughs> you have to, no, as in if you cannot watch it today, as uh -huh. in the sixth, the fifth, mm. guys, still there's a chance for everyone. The, the tickets are at how much? Twenty. Uh, no ticket prices, bro. So um, the cinema has prices like Thursday. Ten, yeah, ten. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, there are no more rates. Like yeah, yes. so the oh. cinema, take charge of that. Okay. So guys, we've come to the end of the show. I swear I cannot thank these gentlemen enough. But thank you so much for coming, and you guys, thank you so much for watching. Get dressed. It's a blue carpet, right? Blue carpet. It's a blue carpet. We are going to <laughs> Cinema, Cinema, Acacia Mall. We must support. Build Uganda, watch Uganda, support Uganda. Because it's the only way, much as this is a co-production, but it's the only way. Love our own. Let's, let's, let's at least go because oh, there's a Ugandan involved. There's Abe Muchib, there's uh, Andrew Venom Chibuka, there's Rema, there's Ruth. There, there's... There are so many Ugandans that are involved in this film. And not only that, it's a beautiful story that you'd love to watch and learn something from it. Because honestly speaking, we ought to watch these beautiful, relatable stories. It has been awesome having you guys on the show. And I cannot go without saying thanks to my camera people. Thank you guys. The editing suit guys, thank you so much. The person in charge of this look, thank you so much. You know yourself, Mirabel at Beauty On. Guys, thank you so much, but all in all, watch Rest TV. We give you endless entertainment. Everything you find it there, and it is safe. It is safe for your children, for the family. We have the gospel, we have the music, we have the, we have the youth hub, we have the, all those shows that you need to watch because it's timeless entertainment. Guys, stay tuned. We love you and God bless you. <laughs>